of you are glad that God is not finished with you yet. Aren't you glad for that? I mean, God is still doing his thing. And in these days, you know, oftentimes the life of faith uh, it feels like three steps forward and then two steps back, right? And then three steps forward and two steps. And maybe you're in a season now where it's like two steps forward, three steps back, right? But even if that's the case, God is not done yet. And just think of, I mean, we sang it, right? Think of where we would be if it weren't for God. If it weren't for the grace of Jesus Christ and the salvation that's in his name, where would we be? I mean, maybe we're at a really low point, you know, but there's a lower point still. And if you're here and if your ears are working within the sound of my voice and you're realizing that God loves you, uh, he's not done with you yet. And we're in the series, you know, called The Call to Perseverance, and we're in the last few chapters of Hebrews. If you want to grab your Bibles, we're going we're gonna to study it some more. And we've been talking about the call to perseverance. God is calling us to not grow weary and lose heart and not, not to throw in the towel, not to quit. In Hebrews chapter 12, we see these words Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with, say it with me, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God." Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We're hearing the call to perseverance. And today we want to talk about persevering in the faith, in this faith in Jesus, to persevere in it. And so the Hebrews 12 passage, you know, what we've learned is that there is, uh, there is a race and we're in it. The race has a finish line and it's not likely to come soon. It's a long race, it's not an easy race, but we're called to uh, endure. We're called to persevere in this race that's marked out for us. And so, bring me back when you can, okay. Hey, okay, there we are, okay. Uh, we're, we're to do these two things. We've studied in the weeks past, if you haven't been with us, just a brief uh, truth and review, where we're to do these two things kind of simultaneously. How do you, how do you persevere in this race? Well, you, you throw off everything that hinders and the sin that entangles, and entangles us and trips us up. up. You, you, you get rid of those things, and you fix your eyes on Jesus, and you pursue him. It's this faith in Christ, this relationship with Jesus, you believe in him, you're in his word, you know that his spirit lives with you, and so you're doing those two things simul simultaneously. In the passage, and it's often, you know, in that first verse in Hebrews 12, we often miss it, right? Where it says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, the chapter heading is right there, chapter 12, and so it's like, whatever that means, let's get, you know, then we read the rest of the, the passage. But the cloud of witnesses is actually a reference to the previous chapter, chapter 11. And when the Hebrew writer wrote this, of course, he didn't put the numbers in, right? So 11 flows right into chapter 12. And this surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, Hebrews 11 is infamous for uh, being this heroes of the faith chapter. When you hear Hebrews 11, it's like, oh yeah, the heroes of the faith. And there's this recounting and this is where we're going in the next couple, three weeks. Uh, we're going to look at these heroes of the faith because they are this great cloud of witnesses. And what they do for us is that they provide example and encouragement for perseverance. Like they ran their race. And some of them, I mean, it's pretty stark, chapter 11. What Christ-following people before us have gone through, God-fearing people in the Old Testament, what they endured, it's pretty, it's pretty astounding, and yet they are considered heroes of the faith because they did, they persevered. And I just want to say, we can be, likewise, heroes of this faith. None of us will say, hey, look at me, I'm a hero. I mean, that's not, that's not how heroes of the faith operate. Heroes of the faith are, are humble people 
who love God and just keep on keep it on. They persevere when things are against them. So we want to be people who are persevering in the faith and who are exercising faith. Uh, to be people of faith who are exercising faith. You know, exercising faith is actually a sign of spiritual maturity. If you're a person who exercises faith, meaning you, you believe what God has said to us in Jesus, and that belief is translates into, into action, into ways of living, into allowing your mind to be recreated in the image of Christ. The way we talk is different because you're exercising faith. You exercise faith, and that's a sign of spiritual maturity. To believe and trust in Jesus, even when you don't know the end from the beginning, you don't know how things are going to turn out. How many of you know exactly how things are going to turn out? None of us do, right? And in that context, exercising faith is, I don't know how things are going to turn out, but, and I don't know the future, but I know the one who holds the future in his hand. And more than that, he holds my future in his hand, and exercising faith says, I believe, I trust. It becomes like a faith snowball, you know, rolling down a hill, a faith snowball, Someone said it's going to snow this week around here. Is that true? All right. When you see the snow on the ground, allow it to think, it trigger your mind. Faith snowball. Am I exercising faith? What happens is when you have faith and you exercise it and you see God actually provide along the way, then it grows. And then the more faith it grows, the more you are like, he's been faithful in the past. I can trust him with my future. And your faith grows and grows and grows. And can become bigger. God is faithful. We're going to read that in the text today. God is faithful, and his faithfulness in the past helps us trust him in these moments with our future. So if we go back just a couple chapters, we just want to remind us and see it again. You may not have seen it uh, earlier, this, this theme of faith in our text, beginning with uh, chapter 10, verse 19. Uh, this is that place where the whole uh, previous uh, nine and a half chapters are sum- summarized in verse 19, where he says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new, a living, new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let's hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. See, what faith does is it it brings this full assurance. You don't know how things are going to pan out. You just know that they are going to pan out. You don't know how God is going to be glorified in this world and in this life, but you know that God will be glorified in this life and in this world. And may he be glorified in us, his people. That kind of faith brings assurance. Like you know that you know that you know. It's faith, but you know. It's not knowledge, we're going to talk about that, but it's faith. You can't see him, but you believe in him. And you know that he is good and he sees you. If you go down further in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 36, notice these words. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and not delay. And, but my righteous one will live by faith, and I will take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. The writer of Hebrews is saying this again and again. The importance of faith, the importance of believing, the importance of not throwing in the towel, but persevering. Not shrinking back, because why? God takes no pleasure in the ones who shrink back. Uh, He's coming, right? He's coming. We need to keep 
exercising faith. We need to keep believing. And he says, we don't belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. We, we are those who have faith and are saved. And then we go into Hebrews chapter 11, which again, that number wasn't there either. But the, and it's a, it's a famous verse too, where it says, now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So right on the heels, right? and I think we, we miss out on so much of the beauty and the power of, of this definition of faith, because in verse 39, right, the encouragement, we are not those who shrink back, we're those who persevere. We're, we're those who have faith. We are those who are numbered in the say, saved. We are people of faith. Now faith, what is faith? Faith is confidence. Faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. You don't see it, but you believe it. You, uh, you're, you're sure of it. You hope for it. This is faith. Faith is believing that a thing is true. And since it's true, it's worthy of my trust. This is what faith is. It's assurance. It's hope. It's being in this relationship with God who's revealed himself to us in Jesus. And it's believing that the gospel is true. And since it is true, it's worthy of my trust. It's believing that God is the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, and he is good and righteous and true. And since he is true, he is worthy of my trust. I can exercise faith because of his faithfulness and who he is. Verse 2 says, this is what the ancients were commended for. You see this chapter 11, heroes of the faith chapter? This is what, this is what made them heroes of the faith. This is... The, this is this is what they were commended for. This is why they're elevated. This is why Scripture writes about them. Were they all perfect? Not at all. In fact, you can't find a one that was without flaw and blemish. And yet, they were people of faith. Um, they were heroes of the faith. They had hope in the unseen. They had confidence and assurance. They persevered through the most difficult of times, and they did not shrink back and and my friends, since they persevered, we can too. They are this cloud of witnesses as our example, encouraging us that we can persevere too. So this month, we're going to look at the stories of Noah and Moses and Jonah and Joshua and Abraham. They're all in this 11th chapter. I encourage you to read it sometime. These are the heroes of the faith. And faith is so important, isn't it? To believe in Jesus, who you have not seen, but believe in him and entrust your life to him. Faith is so important. There are times where Jesus healed people. Remember what he would, he said more than a few times, by your faith, you've been healed or delivered. It's by your faith. And if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, right, you can say to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, it will be done for you. It's by faith, it's by faith over and over again. So to be people of faith, becoming heroes ourselves of this faith, being examples of those coming behind us, we can, we can do this. There's, there's a passage in Romans 10 that I want us to read together because in Romans 10, Paul talks about this faith and some very, very important ideas that, that uh, we need to know and understand. Uh, in verse 8, he says this, what, but what does it say to you? What is this message of faith? I'm going to turn here. This message of faith, uh, the word is near you, it's in your mouth, in your heart. That is the message of faith we, ha we proclaim. Verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on the one they have not believed in? Some rhetorical questions here. Uh, and, the, and the answer is, well, they can't. 
How can they call on the one they've, they've not believed in? They can't. How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? Well, they can't. How can they hear without someone preaching to them? They can't. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all the Israelites accepted the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? Consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. This is why it's important for us to be people who believe the gospel and even have it on our lips, on our hearts, on our lips, on our minds. Because God, uh, we need to encourage one another in this faith, right? We need to preach the gospel to ourselves at times. We need to remind one one another of the truth that we believe in and who we are in Christ. Faith comes by hearing. It's important to hear the message. I'm confident, you know, while there's some who are listening who Maybe you're just now coming to faith in Jesus. We, we're praying for you. We're a church that wants to help you in this walk of faith and come to faith and, and to profess with your mouth the faith that you have and to become a person who is following Jesus with your life. But the vast majority of you, I know, have heard this gospel before. Why are you sitting here? What are you doing here? You know God loves you. You know that Jesus died on the cross? Man, don't you have anything better to do on Super Bowl Sunday than sit in church? Do you know why you're here? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing about the word of Christ. And we are never too old and we are never too old in the faith to not uh, be blessed and benefited by the hearing of the good news. When we meet in our small groups and in our discipleship groups, and one day, you know, when we're back to meeting from house to house, it's what we're doing. We're, we're reminding one another of this faith because faith comes by hearing. And we tend to forget, but we don't want to be people who forget. We, we don't want to be people who shrink back. We want to be people who remember. We want to be people who are filled with faith and believe the gospel. And so we preach the gospel to one another and to everyone who will listen. This is how it works. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Do you believe today? Maybe you're one who's saying, but I can't believe what I can't see. You can't see God, and that's true. You can't. No one has seen God. Jesus said, if anyone's seen me, they've seen the Father, but no one has seen God. One day we'll see God face to face. That day is coming. But don't say, I can't can't believe in what I can't see, because you believe in things you can't see all the time. All the time. Uh, You put your faith and your trust in all kinds of things, Um, and if you actually can see it, it's actually not faith. This is the, one of the interesting things about faith. Faith is not knowledge, because once you know something, faith is no longer required. When we see Jesus face to face, our faith will become sight, and we will be in his presence forever. And in that day, my friends, faith is no longer required, because we will see him. But as for now, we wait and we are people of faith. We believe. And so if you don't, haven't put your faith in Jesus because, well, you, you can't put your faith in what you can't see, well, you have to understand the very definition of faith that we hear, see here in Hebrews 11. Faith itself is this confidence and this assurance in what we cannot see. So uh, you, can, you can believe in this. That's what faith is. What you need is faith. Um, Verse 3 in Hebrews 11 says this, By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what was invisible. It's by faith that we understand that God is the one who created the heavens and the earth, which is, you know, in our world and society, that's, you know, up for great debate. And people have other ways. You know, there's no, uh, there's no faith needed to know was the world and the universe created? It doesn't take any faith to say, is there a world? Because, right? There is a world. 
The faith comes in with the natural question is, how did this world get here? And we look up into the universe. How did this universe get here? Right? And some will say, well, I, I have a way to explain the, the origins of the universe apart from faith. No, you don't. For one simple reason. None of us were there when the universe began. And so all of the theories that we, you know, can learn about are very interesting, but they all come down to things that you cannot see. Are you going to believe that or not? So you can believe in things that you don't see. You do all the time. What's it? I, I love Job. This last year when we read through Job, this Job 38th chapter, of course, part of it is reading through Job, which at times can be just like, oh man, agonizing and like painful and difficult and challenging. And then you get to Job 38 verse Four, and God finally speaks. Most of the book of Job is Job talking and his friends talking and they're all talking. And then God speaks, Job 38, four through seven. And God says these words to Job because Job had gotten to the point where he was like really complaining to God. Like I didn't deserve any of this, which was true. And, I don't, and, what, uh, uh. and then God just says, hey, uh, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand. Who marked off its dimensions? Surely you know, Job. Who stretched out a measuring line across it? On what were its footings set? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy? Right? God's saying, did, are you the one that did that? Were you there when I did that? And the answer is no. And Job's response is that powerful and beautiful because he's just filled with humility then. He just says, I, what? I haven't been there. And you are God of all. This God whom we have never seen, has, we've never seen him, created what we do see out of what was invisible. And our faith says that it is, we're sure of it. We're confident of it. You might be a person who says, you know, but I'm not a person of faith and actually, when it comes to the universe, you know, I hold to one of those theories, Big Bang Theory. Listen, if you hold to the Big Bang Theory, I would tell you, you are a person of faith. You are a person of faith. Don't say you're not. You're a person of faith, too. There's no question that the universe exists. It's just how did it come about? Hebrews 11.3, by faith we understand that God created the universe. We go down to verse 5, Hebrews 11.5, by faith Enoch was taken, but before he was, right? By faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. You can read about Enoch in the book of Genesis. He could not be found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. This is amazing. Enoch was taken, and he was one who pleased God. And what's encouraging is that you can be a person, he was, who can, with your life and with your heart and your thoughts and your mind, you can please God. This creator of the universe, you can please him. Enoch did it because of faith. We see in verse 6, important lesson for us about faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who uh, comes to him must what? Must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Really important, Hebrews eleven six. Enoch was one who had faith and his faith pleased him. In fact, God was so pleased with Enoch that he just took him to heaven, just took him up. He didn't die, he just scooped him up. We can follow Enoch in, in pleasing God and the way we please God is by faith. We must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him, which means I'm going to pursue Jesus. I'm going to, I, don't, I haven't seen him, but I'm pursuing him. Why? Because I believe in him. And God rewards those who seek him earnestly. So do you hear the call to persevere in this faith today? I want to encourage you, persevere in this faith. It may, it may you know, circumstances may rattle you. Things may be disappointing, discouraging, but persevere in the faith. And if you haven't come to faith in Jesus yet, I just want to encourage you. 
He is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I came to, that you might have abundant living. And whatever other way that you're, that you're choosing to live now, I, there's, human history, the track record is that any other way is a dead end. Every other way falls short. Every other way of living, right, winds up being something that's very selfish and sinful, and you get hurt, other people get hurt. The way of Jesus is the way. It's not the easiest way, but it's the way of, most, of the most soul-satisfying kind of life because you're by faith believing and living for the one who loves you so much. So if you're coming to faith to, in Christ today, just want to encourage you in, in every possible way. We as a church family are here to encourage you. and We know you have questions. And we want to help you find the answers and how to follow Jesus. Can you say today... I don't understand everything that's going on. But my hope and my confidence is in Jesus. If you will persevere in that faith, if you'll continue on, you'll be a hero of the faith. You'll be leading the way for those that are coming behind you. Your children, if God's blessed you with children, grandchildren, you can be this person of faith. I love what Peter wrote. 1 Peter 1, verse 8, Peter says to the church, though you have not seen him, talking about Jesus, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. I pray that you would persevere in faith today. Father, we thank you for your grace in our lives. You do not give up on us. You're not uh, finished with us yet. You've been so good to us, and you, you're faithful. We want to please you, Lord. We want to know you and live for you and to see you do great things in our lives and in our church and in our city and county, Lord. In this world, may your name be glorified. Would you strengthen our faith? Would you help us to see the things that kind of derail us? And may we keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus. We thank you for the salvation that you've provided. Our confidence is in you. Lord Jesus, you more than able to save. And we rejoice today in that salvation. We thank you and we love you. In the name of Christ we pray. And all God's people said amen. Amen. Let's stand and sing our commitment.